everybody. Uh, I hope you're having a, a good morning. And uh, today the uh, topic I'm going to be talking upon is continuing on the sacrificial life, but the theme is looking at generosity. So when you hear the word generosity, what do you think of? Well, who do you think of? Do you think of yourself as being a generous person? Or do you immediately think of someone else who epitomizes what is generosity to you, what it means? And what do we mean by generosity? Is it to do with the giving of our finances or is it to do with giving of resources such as time? Or is it uh, generosity of spirit in being able to accept other people for who they are? And the answer to these questions is yes, to all of them and probably more. The Cambridge Dictionary defines generosity. Aha, maybe it's the other one. Yes, it is the other one. Defines generosity as a willingness to give help or support, especially more than usual or expected. A willingness to give help or support, especially more than is usual or expected. And I, I, I like that. I think that's a pretty good definition. It's nice and simple. Now, have you ever been in a restaurant? When the meal comes out to you, and it's a lot bigger than what you think. And you say, ah, that's a generous helping, isn't it? The opposite is also true. If you get a very small portion and you look at each other and think, it's not very generous, is it? No. So we have some context of what generosity is. And uh, I remember many years ago when Alice and I had been away from Australia, we came back after five years, Stony broke, and her parents generously lent us a significant sum of money, interest-free, so we could uh, put a deposit on our first house. And it was a, a real act of generosity. I suspect it was all of their savings, all of their savings, which they invested in, in us for this thing. And we were, you know, very grateful for it, very grateful for it. I, it to me, it was unexpected. I, you'd have to ask Alison if she knew anything about it but they had very little to give, but they were very generous to it. And I think we can all think of acts of generosity that we've received from family or from friends in different ways. But then there's a different aspect to generosity. When it flows outside of our immediate family or friends and from recipients or two recipients that we may not even know, you know of or know where the gift has come from. And so this morning, the message continues on this theme of sacrificial living with a focus on generosity. And before I go any further, I'd just like to say how appreciative the leadership team is of the generosity of this church. It is a very generous church, and I would just have to confirm that. You're generous with your giving, you're generous with your time, and generous in many aspects of the inputs you have into each other's lives. So just on behalf of that, I want to get that set up front. There are many passages in the Bible that relate to giving to generosity. But I today just want to have a look at one passage, just one passage, and just one example where one man's generosity actually changed the whole course of Christianity. It, it happened in a way that no one could have really anticipated. And I don't think he had anticipated it either. And his generosity was based on a healthy fear of God. It was based on moral uprightness and uh, uh, dignity, you might say. His generosity wasn't based on what he might receive in return, but it was given sacrificially to God. And it's a wonderful example, I think, of sacrificial living as he kept his eyes focused on God and not on himself. So now hopefully I've whetted your appetite and aroused your curiosity as who, and we have a drum roll now. We're going to speak about the amazing story of Cornelius in the book of Acts. Now Cornelius is first mentioned in Acts 10, but I'm gonna divert now because on Friday, I became a grandfather again, and Natalie, Natalie, my daughter in England, and her husband, Ollie, who you've all been praying for for a long period of time, had their second child. And he's a healthy four kilogram boy, as yet unnamed. So uh, I was speaking to Natalie last night and suggested he, she might want to consider the name Cornelius, 
But she thought ahead of when he goes to school and how names got abbreviated and she, she shut that one out. Yeah. So Cornelius was a Roman centurion and this was a mid-level position in the Roman Empire's military. And his role consisted, consisted of leaving a hundred men in times of war and times of unrest and other times as well. And the Roman uh, legion consisted of five to 6,000 men and uh, was divided into cohorts or regiments of 600 people apiece. And the Bible specifies that Cornelius was part of the Italian cohort or regiment. And these were Italian born fighting men who were probably considered to be a bit more loyal to the Roman emperor than perhaps from the Roman soldiers recruited from the Eastern colonies. Judea at this time wasn't actually a Roman colony. Syria to the north was, Egypt to the south was, but um, Judea and Samaria and Galilee were under the authority of tetrarchs, which were a bit less than kings, but still had authority, but they were appointed by the Roman emperor and they were responsible to a Roman procurator. And you try and say that word, that's a hard one, procurator, yes, who at the time of Jesus was Pontius Pilate. And so the, that was a level of authority, but a lot of the day-to-day -day, uh, work was done through the chief priest and the council of elders, uh, the Sanhedrin. So there was an uneasy relationship between the Roman authority in Judea and also the religious authorities headed by the chief priest. Now, a centurion would typically oversee the day-to-day -day life of his soldiers and look after them. And obviously the centurion was under the authority of higher, higher ups, but a Roman centurion could actually be appointed by the Roman emperor. So the Roman emperor could, as an act of patronage, say to someone, you're a centurion now. And it was a way to establishing some degree of wealth and authority. Now, we don't know um, what the situation was with Cornelius, but he was one of the soldiers that was garrisoned in, uh, uh, in Judea. And they think that there was only a couple of thousand Roman soldiers in Judea at that time. And they were located mainly in the city of Caesarea, Maritima, which is on the coast about uh, 50 kilometers north of Jaffa or Joppa, as we'll hear about later on and about 40 kilometers north of present-day Tel Aviv, which didn't exist in those, uh, those times. Now, Caesarea was built by Herod the Great, uh, the great building king, uh, and it was named after Augustus Caesar, and I, that was probably an act of trying to curry a bit of favor with the emperor, I suspect. But it was a Rogan, Roman pagan city, okay? It wasn't like Jerusalem, which was a Jewish city, it was a pagan city. It had a massive artificial harbour. It was one of the largest in the world at the time. And it also, he built theatres such as this one. And this is part of the Roman theatre at uh, Caesarea. I think the chairs may not date back to the Roman era, however. Yeah. And these are the ruins of the Hippodrome that was built to race chariots up and down. So it was quite a splendid city. And water was brought in from uh, the mountains many, many miles away through this uh, giant aqueduct. So it was quite an impressive place. And if you ever have a chance to go on a discipling trip to Israel and you go with Ben and Helen, you'll spend some time in Caesarea Maritima, a very interesting place. Now the story about Cornelius starts in Acts 10, and it's not one of those passages we would normally expect to think about when thinking about the sacrificial life and generosity. However, before we look at that passage, I'd just like to get a little bit of context there. After the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the church grew rapidly, but that was followed by a period of persecution. And we see the time when Stephen um, was martyred, he was stoned to death by the Jews, and then there was a persecution against the, the Christians and they fled you know, to Judea and, and into Samaria and other places as well. And then Saul on the way to Damascus to imprison more Christians and persecute them again, had an encounter with Christ and his life was changed. Then towards the end of Acts 9, it says that peace settled. And so 
there was a, some degree of stability and centrality where the gospel could be shared again. And this is the, the time in which these events happen. So it's relative calm in the land. So let's look at Acts 10. And I'll just read through from uh, verse 1. And there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. But at the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming towards him and saying, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. I oh, would be too, I think. And said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. And he will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his servants uh, and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So then he had, when, he, when he had explained to the, all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now I'll finish my reading there and I'll return to it a minute in a minute after I summarize the subsequent events because this is what I want to focus on this morning but the subsequent events are, are relevant to some extent. Okay, so at the same time, Peter, who was in Joppa, had this dream and he had this dream of this big sheet coming down from heaven filled with unclean animals and he, he heard a voice saying, rise Peter, kill and eat and that's happened three times. And Peter was in shock. I, how can I do this? You know, I'm a Jew. I don't eat unclean animals. And exactly that time, as he woke up, these visitors from Caesarea knocked on the door and invited him to come back to Caesarea. Now, now Peter, being a God-fearing Jew, shouldn't have gone with them because he wasn't allowed to go into a house of a Gentile because that was considered to be an unclean place. But he did. He went there and he shared the gospel with Cornelius and his whole household. The whole household was saved. They all came to know Jesus. And then, just as at the time of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on the whole household of Cornelius and they all received the Holy Spirit. Amazing. And then Peter realized that what had happened to the Jews could also happen to the Gentiles. And this opened the pathway for Christianity to flow into the Gentiles and change the course of Christianity in, a, in an amazing way. So now I'd like to go back to uh, chapters, uh, chapter 10, but just go back to verses one to four. And just have a look, look at this once again. So there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Okay. A devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So I'll just leave it there for the moment. So look, even though Cornelius was a Roman centurion, we know that he was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He was obviously a believer in the God of the Old Testament. But what did that actually really mean? It's an interesting question as to what was the precise religious status of Cornelius? Whether was, was he a proselyte or a convert to Judaism in any sort of technical sense? In the indications of that he was not. Because throughout the narrative in Acts 10 and Acts 11, which I'd encourage you to read uh, later on. But in that narrative, he's simply referred to, referred to as a Gentile or uncircumcised. And it seems as though he had heard from the Jews or learned from the Jews about God and had to worship the true God. He wasn't in any sense a Jewish convert. How his belief in God came about, we don't really know. Perhaps he heard Jewish scriptures in the synagogue or was taught by someone. Um, whether he held these views before he actually arrived in Caesarea, we don't know that either. Perhaps he'd heard this before he was stationed in Caesarea. But Caesarea 
being a pagan Roman port city, displayed all the paganism for which the Romans were despised by the Jews. So to follow after God in this Roman pagan context, then Cornelius would have had to turn his back on that pagan religiosity at a cost to himself. Now, Cornelius was described as devout and God-fearing, but what do these descriptions actually, actually mean? Now, would you describe yourself as devout? If I was to say, I am a devout believer, does that sound a little pretentious? It probably does, doesn't it? You, you think of someone perhaps being a little bit full of themselves, a bit puffed up, if they, they use that terminology uh, to describe themselves. It's a bit out of favour. But the Webster Dictionary says the meaning of devout is com committed or devoted to some religion or to religious duties or exercises. And it would seem that it would be best used to describe someone who was sincerely and strongly committed to their particular beliefs, someone perhaps like Mother Teresa. So, but we can presume that Cornelius believed strongly in the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews, Jehovah Jireh, and undertook his religious duties and spiritual disciplines seriously. He's also described as God-fearing or one who feared God. And that can mean being afraid or in terror of God. That's one aspect of it. But it could be better expressed as uh, respecting, obeying, submitting to uh, God's discipline and worshipping him in, with awe and reverence. But either way, a picture is painted of Cornelius as being strong and sincere in seeking after uh, and believing in the God of the Old Testament. And he did that as best he could. He wasn't perfect, but he did it as best he could with the information that he currently had. But not only that, he'd instilled faith and belief into his whole household. So I guess that means his immediate family, his servants, his slaves. And we're even told that the soldier that went to Caesarea with his two servants was devout. So some of his soldiers under his uh, command were also uh, believers. So from God's perspective, does he call upon us to be devout and God-fearing believers? Undoubtedly he does. Is there a cost involved in this? And I'd have to say yes, there's a cost or sacrifice in time and putting to one side one's own personal preferences to pursue God. Is it easy? No, the answer to this is no, especially when the busyness of life gets in the way. And presumably, this was also true of Cornelius, as he sacrificed his time and energy to pursue God. And Cornelius is also, if you look at uh, verse 2 up there, described as one who gave alms generously to the people and prayed always. Now, we spent the month of February in this uh, looking at life in focus. The topic was prayer. So I'm not going to really go into that aspect of uh, what's on, on, on this verses uh, today. But just suffice it to say that in Cornelius's case, prayer went hand in hand with his alms giving and generosity. Now, these alms that he gave weren't the temple tax which were levied upon Jewish people, nor a tithe to support the Levit Levitical priesthood. Because Cornelius was no, under no obligation to support either of these. It doesn't mean he didn't, we don't know, but the, there wasn't the obligation because he wasn't, in essence, a Jew. But his devotion to God, coupled with his generous heart, led him to provide alms to those in need. Now, the Greek word translated arms in the New Testament originally meant mercy or kindness, then came to represent the kinds of deeds caused by mercy and kindness. So it came to mean charitable giving to the poor or giving motivated by love. And, and many times the words translated as charitable deed. And Jesus taught 
a fair bit about arms. He mentioned it in quite a few of his uh, messages and uh, teaching to the disciples. And Jesus taught his disciples not to worry. And in Luke 12, 33, he told them, don't worry, sell what you have and give arms. That is, give it away. <laughs> Provide yourself money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. But Jesus also made it clear that our motives were important in this concept of giving alms. In the Matthew 6, he says, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have their glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And today we see billionaires that give away lots of money to charity and good causes. And in some cases, they do it in private, and that's wonderful. But other times, they, they want the whole world to know what they're also doing. But they will have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So arms are not offerings to worship God. They're not offering, they're not to support the ministers or the workers. Arms are charitable deeds, gifts to the poor and needy, helping people who are in trouble. And arms are important to God. They're an act of love. And we're not made right by giving alms to people before God. We're only made right through what Jesus has done for us. We're not made right with God by any works that we do. We're only made right with God through what Jesus has done for us. But as children of God, we should help care for others who God also loves. So we might say arms are gifts of love to help people in trouble. When we look at Cornelius's uh, generosity in giving arms, it is important to consider his motives. And I don't believe... Um, I don't believe he did it just to gain a good reputation or to benefit from the power and influence that might give him. I think Cornelius was doing what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6, even as though he hadn't heard this. He hadn't heard it. He hadn't had an encounter with Jesus. He didn't even know about Jesus at this time. But he was doing his good deeds in secret. And it was part of living sacrificially with his eyes focused on God and what he required rather than on himself or what he might get out of it. So motive is really, really important in this giving of arms. But Cornelius didn't put his hand up and say, okay, God, I'll give you this much. No. He didn't say, there's a limit. I'm going to just give you part of my life. His belief in God also shaped his actions or his attitude shaped his actions. David Chocker was here last year. I don't know how many of you came to see David Chocker when he's here. It was a, quite a few, yeah. And when he was here, he spoke about how we could uh, listen, test, and know how God speaks. And our study our life group has been looking at uh, David Chocker's book on this, and uh, we've just uh, completed it. But in the study, he, he writes of our need to be fully surrendered to God if we want to hear more clearly from God. The more fully surrendered they are, the more clearly we will hear from God. And I believe this is what happened to Cornelius. Because in verse 4, the angel that spoke to Cornelius noted two things about this Gentile that was significant in heaven. His prayer and his generous alms giving. His prayer and his generous alms giving. They were so significant that the angel said, they were a memorial before God. It's interesting, a memorial before God. Have you ever considered that your arms and prayers could be considered a memorial before God? Or in other words, God remembers what you've done and he sees it and he remembers it. This concept of a memorial to God goes back to the Old Testament. And in Leviticus, oops, oh, sorry. I should have put that up before, so never mind. 
In Leviticus 2, 1 to 3, it says, Whenever anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, one of whom shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil and all the frankincense, and the priest shall burn it as a memorial on the altar, as a memorial on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord, a sweet aroma to the Lord, a handful of flour taken from the grain offering and mixed with oil and frankincense and burnt on the altar as a memorial offering was a sweet aroma, and I believe pleasing to the Lord. In Psalm 20, David wrote, May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. And God's got a plan and God's got a purpose for each one of us. And these are plans to bless us and give us a future and a hope. And God used Cornelius in a very significant way And the purpose for his life, or one of the purposes, was fulfilled in the whole narrative of his conversion. He probably didn't know that that was his purpose for his life, but God knew, and Cornelius walked into it. It's interesting because God has a purpose for each of our lives too. And they may be much more modest in our own eyes than what happened to Cornelius But from God's perspective, it's very, very significant, as significant as it was for Cornelius. The question is, to all of us, is are we willing to fully step in and embrace the purpose or purposes that God created each one of us for? There's another significant word included in verse 2, and I'll flip over to this. And I've underlined it there. It's the word generously. God was impressed with his Roman soldiers generous giving to meet the needs of the poor. It wasn't just the bare minimum to get some brownie points or sign off on the checklist for God. Okay. No, it was a willingness to give help or support, especially more than is usual or expected. And what he did got God's attention. It got God's attention. It changed something in the heavenlies. It seems as though it opened the way for Cornelius to, uh, or God opened the way for Cornelius to fulfill all his purpose. And, and the purpose was empowering the way, pioneering the way for the Gentiles, which includes all of us here, to enter into the kingdom of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it is interesting to see that God remembers and responds to acts of generosity acts of generosity by his children. And that's one of the criteria, I believe, that God uses to select individuals for specific tasks. It's, it is as if God is saying, your generous generosity has opened the way for your prayers to be answered. But generosity comes at a cost. When we give of our time or of our resources to a greater level than what is expected, it costs us something. It's a principle, though, of putting other people's interests before our own. It means to sacrifice of our own self-interest or selfishness for the sake of others. And Gavin preached on that last week, and exactly that point. Why is generosity seemingly so important to God? Why, when Cornelius was generous, did it strike a chord with God? Why did he say this, you know, I will remember this, I remember this. And I I think it's because it's a reflection of God's own nature. Because when God sees his attribute evident in his own children, it gives him great satisfaction and pleasure. Two Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And just getting back to that uh, 
generosity and being part of his own nature. You, you know, when you're a parent and you have a young child and you're trying to teach them to share things and share what they have with other kids and, and be generous. And when you see that happen, how do you feel? You feel really great that that child has got it. They've caught on. And that's a reflection of our own nature, which we want to instill into our children as well that generosity. And I think that's how God sees it when we're generous as well. Because our God is a generous God. He does things with abundance and extravagance. And you've got to only look at the creation and just see the generosity and the abundance and the, the, the extent of it all. But there is an extra dimension to God's generosity. And I believe that's when he gives us something freely at great cost to himself. Consider the gift of free will. He's given that gift to each one of us. Each one of us can choose whether to accept him or to reject him. This free gift is given to us by God sacrificially because he knows that many will reject him and that will cause him great pain and grief. So there's a sacrifice involved in that from God's perspective. And Jesus himself, I believe, is the greatest example of generous alms giving when he sacrificially gave his own life for the life of others, for all of us. He laid it down. He did not consider his own self-interest. And what he did was an act of extreme generosity, which we celebrated a few weeks ago at Easter time. Getting back to Cornelius, he gave generously of his resources and he gave generously to God in, in time in his prayer. The sacrifice of generous almsgiving to those in need isn't dependent on the quantity of the giving. In the story of the widow's might, which I'll just touch on very, very briefly, you know, this widow went up to the temple and gave a small coin, which wasn't very much at all. But in comparison to what she had, it was a huge amount. And Jesus commented on that to the disciples. And he said, what she did has greater significance in heaven than people that give out of their abundance. She gave out of her lack. And I think this is true also of our time and especially our free time. To give that in service to other people is a sacrifice when we'd have other things we'd rather do by watching the Raiders lose last night. No. <laughs> Although each of us have the same amount of time into our, in, in the day, and the last time I looked, it was 24 hours, and I think that's still 24 hours. So we all have 24 hours, but some are at different stages of life than others. However, do we use some of the free time that we have you know, for, for, for serving other people? You know, God knows the time you pour into the lives of your families and your kids and other things that are just part of your life that we have to do. But we all, we all have some free time. Do we use some of that free time as a sacrificial offering to God? Perhaps in helping others or ministering to the poor. And it's interesting to know, it's good to remember, to remember that sacrificial almsgiving is a sweet aroma to the Lord. And he remembers it. And God used the generosity and prayers of Cornelius in an amazing way. So what can we conclude about Cornelius? He was a disciplined leader of men. He was devout. He feared God in the midst of a Roman, pagan Roman culture. He generously gave of his resources and time in ministering charitable deeds to the people. God saw and remembered his actions and used him in an amazing way to advance his kingdom. And God can use each one of us, you know, young or old, rich or poor. He can use each one of us amazing ways as we submit our lives to Christ and generously and sacrificially give of our time and resources to others in need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a generous God. Father, you thank you that you love to see that attribute displayed in your own children. And Father, we, we, we ask that you would encourage us, enable us, Father, to step out and be 
agents of your generosity, Father, into the situations of life in which you praise us, place us. So we thank you for who you are, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.